Just to start off with the, the solar question, um, and I've got some other prepared notes here, but uh, uh, I'm working with Charlie Myers, Representative Myers, to write the new legislation for renewable energy throughout Illinois. And uh, the way we're going to approach it is uh, personally owned solar energy panels will remain as personal property. It's a commercialized ones and also looking at protecting agriculture and, and our road networks and all that. Those are the ones that will be taxed similar to the way we tax wind turbines. Okay, so if we put one up, we're looking at putting one up on our hog buildings. That would be personal property um, because there were a lot of questions about is it going to be personal property or um, taxed, but it will be considered personal property, not taxable. And uh, that's the direction we're going with. We're working with a lot of different agencies to, to get this language right so we can get it through the House and onto the Senate because a lot of these, there's movement already to get these solar farms set up and we want to get that legislation in place so uh, glad to be here a good crowd let's talk about the what's happening in Springfield um, this past Wednesday uh, the governor gave his state of the or his budget address and uh, a lot of high points and a few low points I just want to discuss some of the, the points that uh, I found to be Interesting. Uh, the governor's budget, he did propose, had a $351 million surplus, and uh, with the intent of actually paying down some of our debt with real money as opposed to using credit. Kind of an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? Uh, isn't that how we all do our business? Uh, that's, I mean, that's how we do business. But uh, there's a few tricks in it, and I'll talk about those here in a little bit. Uh, Education, uh, the governor's always had a strong uh, desire to, ed to provide education uh, to our K through 12s. This year that budget is $8.3 billion. Um, some would say it's 50% of what we really need to educate our kids, but it's more than what we've ever had. Um, the governor did put the additional $350 million in this budget for education as part of the agreement with the adequacy funding model that every year there'd be a 350 million dollar increase in the education budget so that is there for continuing um, you might recall last was it august we passed the uh, education budget and with that uh, there's a lot of winners throughout the 74th district a lot of schools within the, uh, the state of illinois that received some additional funding for their school programs and uh, Thought it was important to keep our schools open that we had to get that passed and, and continue so young men or young boys like this could continue their education in schools. Where do you go to school at? Um, you go to Cambridge? Great school. Um, also, um, the governor had a commitment to uh, continue with the Illinois State Police education program. We anticipate the next year to have 300 more troopers on the road. Um, I spent a day with one of our local state troopers. I got in his quad car at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and rode with him until 10 o'clock that night. And the miles that we covered was incredible. Um, the half, Rock Island being a halfway point, the, the district here that we're all part of goes clear down to Peoria. And there's two troopers on the road throughout the day. We need more troopers uh, because it's just not safe. And uh, with this commitment, uh, Potentially, we'll have some more troopers in our area too. The governor, I don't know if you, and also, um, yeah, the governor also committed $31 million to fund, continue to fund education for our veterans and our National Guard scholarship programs. Um, that was something that uh, hadn't been funded in quite some time, and uh, actually, our higher education was paying for that out of their own pocketbook. So now we've got that money put back in there. Of course, the budget all has to be approved, and all these numbers have to be approved by the House members and the Senate. But uh, it was encouraging to see that funded once again. He had a commitment of fifty million dollars to Quincy Home. Um, I currently serve on the uh, Water Maintenance Task Force for our Quincy Home. Um, we've got the Legionella disease there. It's very disturbing that we've lost thirteen veterans since November two thousand fifteen because of Legionella. 
Um, just this past Wednesday, there were two more veterans identified with Legionella, and just yesterday, uh, one more was identified with Legionella. And so now we've got three of them with Legionella once again. Legionella is a, a bacteria that actually hangs in the water, and uh, once it passes through the water system, it has to become a vapor before a veteran can contract Legionella, or anyone can contract Legionella. It's not just taking a drink of water, it has to be in a vapor format. So a lot, just most recently, our faucets and sinks and those areas that um, put water out are getting a new, uh, a new device put on them so they don't vaporize it. It truly is just a water flow. Every four hours, every resident at Quincy Nursing Home, their temperature is taken. And the first sign of Legionella is a spiked temperature. If their temperature is spiked, then they immediately uh, perform a urine analysis. And those results then are sent to the, nurse, the uh, hospital there in Quincy to be determined if they have Legionella. If they have Legionella, then they begin immediate medication process. Um, it's not transferable, so you can't transfer this disease, but it's something that uh, this $50 million, I've already spent about uh, $4 million redoing the whole water pumping station, chlorination station, because what the biggest harm for the biggest um, preventive measure we can take is to keep that water circulating. Just at home, if you have a faucet you don't run for quite some time, you open that faucet up, you get a little rust. Well, that's what happens if this water sits stagnant in the line for any time at all. That Legionella detaches from that pipe, gets in the water stream, and then goes off to a residency. So um, I serve on a water task force. The governor appointed me on that. And uh, we had our first meeting this past uh, Tuesday morning, and uh, we're seriously looking at how we can prevent. Um, the interesting thing is, is um, you know, this happened in 2015, but a lot of the CDC has been involved from day one uh, to help us identify. We're following CDC requirements and also implementing others that have been suggested by other professional uh, water treatment people. So, $50 million towards the Quincy home to help. Um, Eradicate this Legionella disease. Dan? Yes. How many residents are there? Oh gosh, I've got it in my notes here. I'm gonna. Some are. Yeah, there's two types of residents there. There are actually the veterans who live there, and then some spouses that can live there in other housing areas. But I'm gonna say it's over 200, maybe 250, something like that. But I, I can get that. I've got it in my notes here. I'll get that number for you. That's a great question, but. Uh, um, I was there and toured back in December, um, right before Christmas, a couple of veterans from Galvin and I went down and toured the facility, and uh, um, you know, it's, an, it's a, quite a place. If you haven't been there, it's neat to visit. But uh, also, um, the governor had a commitment, to, and has always had a commitment, to continue services at the Kiwani um, Life Skills uh, Center. And uh, we, there's two of these, if you knew that or not, but the Kiwani has a life skills reentry center where inmates apply for in, inmates who have served long term in prison. And long term, I don't know what the definition is, 20 years or more possibly. I don't, some, we, we've got a, <clears throat> the guys that, a lot of the guys that we have are 15, 20 year. Um, I've got one guy came in a couple weeks ago, had an 80 year sentence. Wow. Now, they serve day for day credit in DOC, so for every day served, they get a day off their sentence. So that 80-year sentence is a 40-year sentence, but I got a gentleman that entered the system at 18 years old. He will leave two years from now at 58 years old. He's been in prison since he was 18 years old. So, um, just think of the change that we've had in 40 years. Right. And that's what we're doing at the Life Skills Center, is helping them work their cell phones, helping them turn on TVs. And, and you know, I was toured there one time. Um, and there was a phone, a whole bunch of inmates sitting, talking on phones. I asked them, what are they doing? They said, well, they're actually doing job interviews over the phone. Um, people will volunteer their time to ask employment-type questions and help them do job interviews over the phone. Just a remarkable place. But the governor, there, there's two of these, as I started to say, Kiwani and Murfreesboro. Um, they're two of the first in the nation, I believe, of this program. And, and when they walk out of Kiwani, they don't walk out in that jumpsuit, they walk out in a suit and tie. 
And uh, I mean, it's impressive what's going on there. Um, families come visit on a routine basis at picnics. Inmates are introduced to their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren. So it's quite a place. But the governor's um, committed another $26.4 million to continue Murfreesboro and, and Kiwani. Uh, trying to, that, that, that is a facility that is something I'm really proud of what, what's happened over there with the battle to, to get that instead of being closed up on the juvenile facility. And uh, the community has really come together to help on that. Those, those uh, the clothes that they walk out of there with, a lot of the churches have put together programs to collect those clothes and they have their nice suits, their nice clothes. I serve as one of the, the uh, regional workforce development group, which consists of Mercer County, Rock Island County, and, and Henry County. Uh, that group, the purpose of that is to provide education for people that have been laid off, for uh, dropout students and, and uh, students that have, haven't got their CEDs and, and they have, it has been expanded where we set up a one-stop shop which brings together all of the different uh, organizations that help find employment and uh, help provide assistance for people for, for employment. And there's like 10 or 12 different groups and one of our CEO meetings, which is a meeting of the three county chairmen, I suggested why don't we work something like that in with the uh, out there at the prison and they have recently started that and they are actually putting people from these groups I believe are going to start going in there a couple times I think they had one here just a while back so that these uh, inmates when they come out they will be familiar with these groups and they will be familiar with who to work with and, and where to go for, for the assistance. This is, I think it's going to really work out. I think it's a big, yeah. Big rock. It, it's certainly, my first tour there was a, an inmate in the art room drawing a picture. So I've been in prison over 20 years. I've never had a chance to even draw a picture. And here we've got an art room. I mean, you know, just those little things that we take for granted. That having served 20, 30 years in prison, 40 years, uh, uh, we're getting an opportunity to see this uh, Thursday. I've invited all the sheriffs from my five counties and jailers to go with me and we're going to tour that facility um, this Thursday so because um, they have an interest in what's going on there too so we're going to take that tour and uh, they're going to have fun. Not to interrupt you but I just wanted to say one thing when people say why are you spending 25 million dollars on an inmate? Good question. Um, it is as taxpayers it is in our best interest to try to get these guys some tools so they can survive on the outside. Because none of you have this problem, but as we get older, we need more medications, we have health issues, and just like the sheriff said, what happens when that inmate becomes diabetic and needs dialysis? Guess who pays for that? Everybody in this room. It is in our best interest to try to give these guys, identify the ones that are that want the help, because we're gonna have guys, and you've got them in jail, there are some knuckleheads that, you don't matter what you do to them, they're gonna be knuckleheads. But out of 40,000 people in the DOC, we can identify five to 600 every year that we can convert, give them the skills and the tools to survive on the outside. And that's what we're about. So if I'm gonna drop another 10 or $15,000 into inmate Olson for a few years to teach him how to weld, and give him those skills to survive on the outside, folks, that's money well spent. Because when Olson comes back into the system, if we don't give him anything, what do we expect? We'll be back in. That's right. And as I get older, and I get heart disease, and all the other problems, the taxpayer, I'm, not, I'm another burden on the taxpayer, and I'm a burden on money that can go to our education system and, and to the other places. So. It sounds like a lot of money, but it's really not. I mean, we, we're still working on developing the programs there. Um, the vocational center, we need to, to work on that also. But we've got a lot of people on the outside that have come in 
including Chicago businesses, including people from the other party. So we're, we're trying to get a holistic approach to doing this. Sheriff? Yeah, that's, that's a great example. I've never even thought of that example, but what we see is the court costs that go into this. They reoffend. You're paying for that public defender, yep. um, and then there. And I see it time and time again when you're paying for that public defender, they may want specialists to come in and testify so that they get a a, a fair trial. Well, then you're paying for that, and so that it doesn't get turned over or appealed, and then you have to go through it. So I mean, er everywhere around, you're you're saving money if you can get them uh, right. corrected. And like I say, we can only hold five to six hundred guys at our facility. Okay, you get much over that, and you have a hard time programming, no matter how big your facility is, doing what we need to do. Um, but we're dealing with people that have never touched a computer in their life, never touched a keyboard. And let's face it, folks, anymore, you don't even apply for a job anymore without on a keyboard. You Skype for the interview. Um, these are the things that they're learning how to do. They're learning how to navigate the internet the right way, how to buy a house, what's a credit card. Um, all the things we take for granted, these darn things. Um, they're, they're learning, they're teaching them how to do that. And it is baby steps, it sounds crazy. Yeah. But think about your life 30 years ago. And if your life stopped at that point, and then 30 years later they open the door and say, go and sin no more. Um, that's what DOC's done. And it hasn't worked very well. So we're trying to change that. Yeah. Uh, the recidivism rate will be interesting once we can get enough out to see how that goes, but I'm very hopeful. Um, the governor also talked about or included a $2.2 billion ISAP funding uh, paid as we go, so it's not a total drop in the count. That is, we need money to fix our roads. Um, he's committed $2.2 billion in this budget for next year. Difficulties with this budget is some of the cost shifts that he's included within that budget. Um, I'm one of several who've signed on a resolution to, to ask him to reconsider. You know, property taxes, what we all deal with in our day to day lives, um, it's the only property, it's the only tax we pay that we can see where every dime goes, though, and your property tax bill. But with what the governor is proposing, is, is truly shifting and saving the state money by moving pension costs to the schools. I mean, that sounds good at the state level. Now we don't have this big elephant in the room of pension costs, but all we did was shift it down to where the schools now are going to have to deal with those costs of pension <coughs> and insurance and stuff. So how are the schools gonna pay for it? Raising property taxes. And and with that too, um, you know that that extra burden that is passed on the schools. He he included a 25 doing this over a four year period, so it's not a complete dump. It's a 25 percent dump. <laughs> and uh, you know what the schools and his argument is is that with the additional 350 million dollars in adequacy for our education. We pay what eight point three billion dollars. Some will argue, like I said earlier, we're about fifty percent of where we should be on education funding. That's to be determined. But that three hundred fifty million dollars we gobbled up quite quickly in those pensions. His idea is that we need to put that expense where the expense is incurred, and his view is that expense is incurred within that school system with the pensions and those things. Um, the devil's in the detail on that, but uh, like I said, I signed on with, uh, I think last time I counted, over 52 other members of the House in opposition to that through a House resolution. So um, hopefully we can get some um, eyes on that to prevent that from, from happening. Um, and I don't have the dollars right here in front of me, but the, the governor did commit uh, full funding once again of the opioid state obligation with our opioid epidemic um, is something that he believes in. It's something that uh, I'm sure won't receive much opposition from either parties, but it's still um, a consideration. 
That's kind of the um, brief comments on the budget. Yes, Bill. Uh, talk about school, and I find we all know about the shooting in Florida. And this seems to be almost a once a month occurrence anymore. And uh, a lot of talk that what are we going to do to make our schools safer? I know I've taught at both Geneseo High School and Maxwell School in Atkinson. Both places, the doors are always kept locked because there's an armed, uh, armed officer at those facilities all the time. And those are some of the things we can do. I'd say that those type of things, to get those type of fixes, is going to cost money. Yeah, I, I don't. It, and both those facilities have an arm. Yes. At, at Geneseo Schools? Well, Geneseo High School and XL School out in Atkinson. Okay. I didn't realize XL did too. Yeah, and it's so the school in Florida. Yeah. Two, 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 two. Yeah. Well, they weren't armed. Yeah, they were. They're police officers. The police okay. officer was upstairs on the second floor. Well, and they blow the fire alarm and all the doors are open. So yeah. everybody's leaving, the kid walks in. Yeah. I mean, it's. <laughs> Yeah, there, there was one one guard with a gun. Two of three thousand. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. And, and that person had been in an institution, had been had had mental problems. Why? Where was it? Because in, the, in Illinois, I just got my FOIA card, and yeah, they asked the question. And sure, if I'm going to get a gun, I'm going to say, oh yeah, I'm fine. You know, I'm not going to anyone. But they do check. Yeah, I, I know the sheriff gets a sheet that he checks. I've had school superintendent call and ask, why don't we have, you know, retired police officers or retired teacher or uh, retired military members who are now teachers in our school, or even our principals or superintendents? Why don't we allow them to, to carry an arm? It's it's a strong argument. It's a strong argument. Um, is this something we can get passed in the House? I don't know. I, I just don't know. I mean, there's a lot of reluctance when you use the word gun, there's a lot of reluctance of anyone putting a, a yes vote on some of this legislation. But uh, something that we should consider, you know, is um, some of our gun free zones are the ones that are most easily attacked. Chicago's gun free zone. What do we have up there? The largest crime rate. And, and so far, I, I've been tracking this, this shooter, this demon. Uh, 14 charges filed against him. Well, I haven't seen any gun charges yet. And I don't know if you've seen any sheriff, if you're tracking or not, but I don't see any gun charges. Why not? You know, that's the reason why we have a lot of problems because we don't always charge people with those guns. But, uh, just a couple more uh, comments here. I currently, I don't know, stupid, brave, or whatever. Um, last year I had two pieces of legislation passed. This year I'm trying to push 11 pieces of legislation. I just kind of want to go just a few of these with you. One of them I've already got through committee. Um, it's, it's an SMA, Spinal Muscular Atrophy Bill. I'm working with a mother and a daughter and believe there's nothing like the passion of a mother with a sick child. Um, spinal Muscular Atrophy is a disease where the message when transmitted from the brain to the legs to move that message is scrambled and doesn't reach those legs to move. So it's 18 months old, this poor girl was diagnosed with SMA, which her legs don't work. She immediately got four, a series of four shots in her spine and went from rolling to crawling within a matter of weeks. She's now three years old and is using one of those jumper seats with her mother holding on to her, she's using her legs. There's a drug called Spinraza that will help. And there's also a new experimental of replanting some of the genes, the gene transplant, that would just eliminate this completely. <laughs> the key is this has to be identified at birth. So my legislation would require every baby that's born that's already a blood test taken from their heel, that this would be one more test. Because if identified within the first six months of birth, we can begin positive treatment and preventive care for this child, for these babies. So very strong on that. I've already got through one committee. Uh, already have somebody ready to run it in the, in the Senate once we get it through the House. Another similar piece of le legislation is Lyme disease. Currently, doctors in Illinois cannot treat a patient with Lyme disease. I've had a, several people from Mercer County. I'm working again with a mother and a daughter. 
Um, her daughter has Lyme disease. She's in the fifth grade. She was misdiagnosed when she was in kindergarten. She was two weeks away from having to go through um, bone marrow transplant. They thought she had leukemia. Turns out she has Lyme disease. She's gone to Illinois doctors and been thrown out of the doctor's office because they won't treat for Lyme disease because of malpractice concerns. Lyme disease is the most misdiagnosed disease out there. So, trying to get that legislation passed. Um, real briefly, I've also got, you've all heard of an Amber Alert, where a child is reported missing. Um, I'm developing, it's already developed a Silver Alert, where an elderly person walks away from a nursing home. I've included language in there with 20 to 22 veterans committing suicide a day. I've asked that we include veterans into that language. Veterans and active duty military members. Instead of having to wait 24 hours to report of someone missing, immediately the state police, sheriff's departments, local police departments will begin looking for that, that veteran as a way of uh, um, doing that. Uh, couple, one other um, indigent veterans legislation, if an indigent veteran seeks VA medical care, that that person will be provided any medical documents free of charge from a private physician who has treated that person in the past. Uh, most doctors will charge a dollar a piece of paper. My legislation would be it's free. Let them have it. And then one last one I want to just comment on, and I, I, I'm focusing on some military, but I do have some other legislation here, but one other piece of legislation Lieutenant Governor asked me to carry was if a, per, if a senior in high school has completed their basic training during the summer of their junior year, that they be allowed to wear their dress uniform of the military that they represent at their graduation ceremony. Kind of a cool thing. The Lieutenant Governor asked me to carry that. So, um, um, talked about, oh, and my last one. Has anybody been to Springfield? Down? Does anyone notice like the Capitol? There's a big building next to it called the Stratton Building. Yes. yes. Every night the lights are on in that building. Yeah. And I tell my LA, my secretary, I said at night, I, I've got an office it's no bigger than a broom closet, but I don't even turn the light on in there because I've got a big window. But I tell her every night turn the light off when you leave. <laughs> she goes, well, the cleaning people get mad. Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, if the cleaning exactly. people get mad, tell them to talk to me, because I don't. So I've got a, a house resolution that's going to include energy efficiencies in state buildings. <laughs> so <I'm pretty> <laughs> you know, just some common sense. <laughs> I've got some uh, fire marshal stuff, some construction stuff. Um, but uh, anyway, that's kind of... You've got, like I said, 11 bills and one house resolution I'm working on. But any other questions? I'll be here around afterwards if we can talk. Yes? Brief comment. We were talking about the DOC and the things that they can do to basically mm -hmm. change it on your car. Get these things done so these guys don't come back. Uh, Rusty Bora, if you guys are familiar with the 180 ministry, he's in Rock Island. They have actually own a city block on that board. We need to get him linked up and maybe even use that model or have him come out and help us in every kind to get guys that are in jail. You know, I've, I've been to the jail a lot of times and helped with AA meetings and stuff, used to. There's some good kids in it that just made some bad choices. If you can catch them before they do something even worse, you know, so, and Rusty can identify these people and they'll go in front of a judge and he'll release them into his custody. They go out like a halfway house, get them a job, some of them are starting their own businesses. It's, it's spectacular what, what they're doing down there. Um, so that's something we need to look at. And then what Phyllis was talking about with the opioids, I did see last week that they are trying to change the feeling you get when you take one of those drugs so that it doesn't trigger that euphoria. Mm -hmm. And if you're recovering, you know what I'm talking about. That's that thing, that, hey man, I'm 10 foot tall bull. That goes away. If they can do that, put that in with that drug, then it won't be so addictive. So there's some things happening that are positive. I just like to bring some positive things up once in a while. Well, thanks for doing that. Thanks, Mitch. That's uh, that is good. Uh, I got a question for you, and it probably goes to Roger. Um, our county veteran service officer has, I guess, resigned or quit or whatever. Um, and our state VSO guy from Kiwani, I don't, I'm not sure he even works there anymore. That's vacant. Are we going to get new veteran service officers for the county and the state? So I, 
<laughs> what I know of the county, um, there, I've seen it in the advertising. There was a job announcement or advertisement for a new um, superintendent for the Veterans Assistance Commission. Um, I don't know what the exact timeline is. I think it, they advertised it twice, and then they were going to make the selection after that once they get all the applicants. Is that a county? Is that? That is the Veterans Commission that hires that person. We, the county provides an office for him, and he goes through our budget process. It's kind of... Yeah, that is, that is a county position. That is paid through the county. So the budget comes from the county for that office space? Yes. And pays the veteran service officer? No. no. They're not a veteran service officer. They're a superintendent. Superintendent. Of the Veterans Assistance Commission. Veteran service officer is in Kiwani. And they're the ones that can help with claims and, and those type of things. <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying, I'm working with um, uh, Erica Jeffries, the, the director of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, to try and get us a person in that key money office. And so if a veteran has a claim, and Gary is the Legion commander, mm -hmm. where do we direct veterans if they want to initiate a new claim or appeal a claim? Um, right now, the closest place is Galesburg. At the Armory in Galesburg, there's two members there, plus also at the um, <coughs> Evans Center, there's a VSO there. And they probably could always do it by phone, right? Um, when they start. They can, they can set up their appointment by phone, but it has to be some form okay. that they have to fill out completely. And, and actually, if I have called that number, just out of curiosity, it's a number I don't even know where it goes to, but um, they say due to current budget restraints or whatever, they're not accepting calls or claims oh. over the phone. Yeah, so, let, let me know where you're getting that from. Hmm. What it's, uh, it's on the internet to the veterans. It's an 800 number. For People can always reach out to your office, yeah. right, Dan? I'm, right. Dan, give your office I'm, number. I'll, 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 I'll call your yeah. office. Sir. My office is 309 334 Seven four seven four. My cell phone is three zero nine five zero seven two nine seven five. Veterans related ag anything to do with state government. I worked for a long time in a legislator's office. If you have a problem, you know, best thing you can do is keep track of what you're doing and reach out to, to Dan's office, uh, to his legislative gal that's over in Woodhall. That's, that's why they're there. That's what they're there to do. Yeah. Uh, if you happen to live in another part of the county, you have another legislator. But uh, you know, always keep them informed because they're, they're your advocate. You know, like they've said, we're paying them to be down there and we're paying their staffs so and they're there to help us and do what they can do. You Don't know, mean to overstep on no, you, but just, you know. Just an example, please, this is not... I, I try, I'm a humble person. This is not a brag. Please don't take this as a brag. But uh, a local business needed a permit to put a driveway in. You're going to build a new business. You've been working for months and months and months to get that permit from the state to put this driveway in along the state highway. In three days, I had that permit in his hand. <laughs> I mean, it's just sometimes it just takes a representative making a phone call. And I, I, it, it's, it's kind of cool. But uh, it shouldn't have to get to that point, right. you know. Just because I call somebody doesn't shouldn't expedite it. It should have already happened. Sure. So, come in. I'm on the I'm on the committee to select a new superintendent for our local BAC. That's we should be voting on that at our next BAC meeting, which I think is going to be should be March in March. Um, in addition, dot mine dot is in fact still processing from her own office. She has a, a new office that she's processing VA claim over in Kiwani, but it's not the uh, state veterans affairs. It's, it's she's doing it as an advocate. I think it's a senior citizen. I, sh I think she's at the senior citizens. Well, she does do that too. But yeah. I, think she, I just got a card from her that says she's got a new office. Okay. So, thank you very much. Um, I gave you my phone number. If you need anything, uh, please don't hesitate to call. Julie can do some amazing things, and together 
um, we get a lot of work done.